Lee Kuan Yew knew the fate of his fragile nation was up to him, and he decided he was going to drag Singapore into modernity, even if that meant with an iron fist. Welcome to New African Thought. This is going to be part two of our comparison between the Singapore model of nation building and what New Africans can do for independence in America. Today's video is going to concentrate more on what are the differences and how we can maybe pick out a few things that we can use from their model. Please make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel because I'm almost at 100 subscribers and I would like to hit that after this video. Peace. The first thing to overcome was the social unrest, while at the same time working to cement the PAP's political power. Individual freedoms were curtailed, free speech was banned, political opponents were jailed without trial, and draconian punishments were carried out for rioting, violence, and drug use. This hardline authoritarian approach even included public canings for chewing gum, graffiti, and public drunkenness. Anyone that spoke out against the government was sued into bankruptcy. Religious extremists, communist Chinese, Malays who wanted to reunite with Malaysia were all silenced or worse. Lee Kuan Yew's solution to the potentially explosive underlying ethnic and social tensions was authoritarian rule. However, as horrible as this was, it worked in curtailing violence, in stabilizing the nation. In his mind, the population would not care about the diminishment of their freedoms if it meant he could provide them with economic prosperity and social peace. So what that means is that we, with the new African independence movement, will be operating under the laws of the United States of America, under the Constitution, and under the legal authority of whatever state that we decide to migrate to. Now, that means that it is important that we try to establish a legal majority to have a voting majority as soon as possible so that we can tailor the laws and the legal system as much as possible to the desires and the needs of the new African independence movement. As far as the one thing that you can learn from this is the government through laws, the legal system and other things can change behavior and behavior is changed on a basis of reward and punishment. In Singapore, the reward was economic condition that, that they created for their citizens and the punishment was severe for the people that opposed them. Now, of course, our punishments won't be so severe, but we can set up some kind of system in which there is a reward and punishment to influence behavior. The most pressing economic problem to address was housing. Representing one of the largest slum populations on Earth, 70% of all Singaporeans lived in rough temporary structures with no plumbing. Lee instituted a controversial law allowing the government to buy land cheaply, to which row after row of affordable housing would be constructed. While initially inspired by the British welfare state, Lee did not want his people dependent on the state forever, as a way to give citizens a stake in the nation's prosperity to increase upkeep of structures and to build wealth Residents were heavily encouraged to buy their apartments at low rates. The way in which they could afford this was through another policy that forced a percentage of one's income to be saved, called the Central Provident Fund. Originally, the savings fund was for pensions. However, Lee modified it, allowing citizens to spend it on housing. Slowly, over time, the amount forced to be saved was increased to 25% of every paycheck, with another 25% being deposited by employers. This eventually made Singapore the nation with the highest ratio of savings to income earned. This savings policy, coupled with cheap rates for state-owned housing, proved to be a massive success. All citizens living in slums were housed, and most started to be able to own their own property. Today, 80% of all Singaporeans live in houses they own that were originally built by the state. 
This has allowed Singaporeans to largely avoid the extreme housing prices in other similar nations like Hong Kong. As you can see, Singapore did not use the old pick yourself up by your bootstraps strategy that African Americans are asked to do in America. It's going to, t to take a people out of immense poverty. It's going to take concentrated government intervention at a large scale, and that's what we see here. That is why the voting majority is the key part. But also, you must have an industry that you control in America from the beginning. And I have an idea on that, but that's going to be a future video. But you have to have an industry that you control. And I've always been of the mind that new Africans have to master capitalism because that is the system of the day globally. So you don't have to do it like everybody else do it, but you have to master capitalism. And you have to master capitalism to the benefit of the group. And there's a way that that can be done. But building houses for the population would not nearly be enough if the economy did not have jobs for them to work at. With no resources, no real existing manufacturing, and neighbors reluctant to trade, Lee knew the only way to grow was by doing everything possible to attract foreign investment. Keeping in line with Singapore's historical roots, taxes and regulations were kept low. Companies were even given massive incentives like being completely exempt from taxes for 10 years. To keep wages competitive, Lee banned unions and actively encouraged businesses to fire all workers when faced with the strike. The government also started dumping money into infrastructure projects and creating sprawling modern industrial zones. Seeing as Singapore's domestic market was small, numerous policies were implemented to gear the economy toward exports. Mixed with Singapore's existing port, incredible geography, and business-friendly policies, simple, labor-intensive foreign businesses started pouring in. This was helped further by Mao Zedong's cultural revolution in China that scared investors away from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Within just 10 years, Singapore had practically zero unemployment, and the economy was growing at a monstrous 13% every year. Singapore would continue to implement hyper-capitalistic policies to increase investment by foreign companies, so much so that it is the second easiest nation to do business in. And that is the key. The new African independence movement is going to have to create industry and industries that can attract dollars from non-new Africans. That might mean other black people that don't fully buy into uh, what we're trying to do, but they will support it because it's black. That might be, you know, other sympathizers that want to contribute, but not as far as direct donations, but through economy. That means buying of products and services that the new African community sells, not through donations. That is a whole different thing. But you have to have an industry that you control from the floor to the ceiling in your area. With an economy starting to become ever more reliant on government intervention, Lee also took drastic measures to cut out corruption. This included sentencing those suspected to death, as well as offering some of the highest wages in the world for government officials, helping to reduce the desire to engage in corruption in the first place. This worked, and today, Singapore is one of the least corrupt nations on Earth. This substantially increased the effectiveness of policy implementation, as well as increasing investor confidence, further boosting growth, and cutting down on wasteful spending. But Lee did not want Singapore to always be focused on simple, cheap manufacturing. He knew the most valuable resource the nation had was its human capital. As such, he started creating technical schools, paid foreign companies to train workers, and created modern hospitals to keep the population healthy. This, in turn, brought in more specialized industry and thus higher wages, higher savings, and more budget for the government to reinvest in education. This created a positive feedback loop of productivity gains. By the 1980s, Singapore was now in the business of petrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, advanced computer components, shipbuilding, chemical manufacturing, and more. 
In fact, despite Singapore's lack of resources, it had become the world's third largest producer of refined petroleum. This is because it had once again become the regional hub of Southeast Asia, importing raw materials from its neighbors, processing and manufacturing them, and then shipping them across the planet. This status of regional hub was further facilitated by Singapore's rapidly growing financial sector, which strategically bridged the gap between American markets closing and European markets opening. This rise was also perfectly timed, as many Asian nations were undergoing tremendous growth, allowing Singapore to act as a logistical and financial hub through which foreign investment was distributed. This, mixed with pro-financial policies, allowed Singapore to become the fourth largest financial center in the world. If you haven't read Dr. Claude Anderson's book, Powernomics, this is basically a playbook for what he was calling for. You start off in a sector that you control the whole vertical with, and then you expand into other sectors once you start making profits. This is something that you can do in America freely. Now, some of the other things that you're going to be able to do, not going to be able to do is like punishments and stuff like this. You know, that's a whole different thing. But we have seen that you can keep people from striking. You can bust unions in the United States legally, and you can set up your legal system and your laws to do so. That is why the voting majority is so key and being in control of government budgets is also so key because you can implement programs sort of like how Marion Barry and Andrew Young did when they were the mayor of the cities. But if you can do it on a statewide basis, control of a state budget system, you can implement a lot more change, especially among your people. And it can be directed because you will have so much more money and resources and legality behind you. But Singapore, coming from such humble beginnings, meant it did not have its own class of entrepreneurs. The lack of capital and technical know-how meant it was impossible for Singaporeans to build substantial companies of their own to compete on the world stage. Not wanting to be left out and to further facilitate growth, Lee organized a group of gifted civil servants and international businessmen to make efficient state-owned enterprises. This included Singapore Airlines, steel, iron, and chemical manufacturing, and many other capital-intensive enterprises. While state-owned companies are usually synonymous with inefficiency, in Singapore, their primary objective from the very beginning was to make a profit. Low corruption in government, Lee's willingness to shut down loss-making ventures, and the lack of unions, which kept costs low, meant these companies were wildly successful. By the 90s, the government began limited privatization of the most profitable, giving Singaporeans preferential rates for buying shares. These companies helped to diversify the economy as well as filling gaps in the market. The revenue generated was also placed in a sovereign wealth fund, which was then used to further funding for healthcare, infrastructure, and education. A lot of concepts introduced in that little snippet. Uh, one about cooperative economics, which was done on a national scale in Singapore. And also the concept of a sovereign wealth fund done and going from public to private. Um, or, you know, just giving the citizens an ability to be invested in the corporations of a nation was very big in Singapore and it's something that can be modeled easily by new Africans, but it just can't be done the exact same way, but there is a way to do it. And we're going to talk about these ways, especially when we get into, um, cooperative, uh, economics, uh, you know, you have co-ops that are, some are running already in the United States. And when we get into, um, sovereign wealth funds, we're going to talk about those also and how, they can be beneficial to new Africans in America. Today, Singapore is one of the richest, most advanced, and competitive economies in the world. It operates the second largest port, is the second easiest nation to do business in, and still attracts the third highest foreign direct investment. Its people have affordable housing. They have access to world-class healthcare, 
and their students test the highest in the world. Its government, under Lee Kuan Yew, was able to efficiently implement policies that relied not on ideology, but on their utility to Singapore's long-term prosperity. But this has, of course, come at the cost of political and certain individual freedoms. While it's hard to agree with its authoritarian governance, it's hard to argue with its success. The consolidated power allowed Singapore to maximize its advantages while limiting its shortcomings. Singapore has always been lucky with its location on one of, if not the most important global shipping lane. It got lucky with writing the growth of globalization in the second half of the 20th century. But most importantly, it got lucky that its dictator, Lee Kuan Yew, was smart and more or less benevolent in his actions. While it might be easy for those of us that live in Western countries to criticize some of Singapore's actions, our ideals and institutions have had hundreds of years to form, while developing nations are expected to do the same in less than a generation. The path Singapore took should not be and likely can't be replicated by other nations. Singapore's economy is not perfect for the world. It's perfect for Singapore. And that concludes the model of Singapore. And we can tell already from what we've learned in this video or in these two videos that we will not be able to replicate what Singapore did, you know, exactly as they did it. But we can take what they did well and use some of the elements that they used and use them in our new African independence movement and build something. And we have to believe that we can build something that can set a model for Africans, black people, globally. Not just here, but in the Caribbean, uh, other parts of the Western world, and in Africa itself. We can be a model, and we should be a model. But there's something that we have to do for ourselves, by ourselves, and it's something that we can do. And we have to remember, it's going to be a lot of opposition to what we plan on doing, but opposition is no reason for us to stop and, you know, get discouraged. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And it's going to take decades, not a few years, anything like that. It's going to take decades. So we're going to start studying a lot of stuff that can assist us in getting up to par on where we need to go as far as now and everywhere. So I'm going to be creating more videos and more models, more things that we can study and more things that I plan on doing as far as uh, practical things, on the ground things that we're going to do. It's just not going to be online stuff and just a bunch of talk. So we're going to do some real things on the ground as far as building brick and mortar stuff on the ground. And it might take a few years, but we're going to do it. So if you like that kind of stuff, Please make sure you subscribe to this channel, like this video so we maybe can get, you know, start getting into the algorithm of YouTube and gather some more like minded people together. Uh, and I'm going to put my Twitter in the description of this video and you can get a hold of me there and start a conversation on Twitter. Peace.